to, uh, I'd like to introduce to you Phil Tickner. Phil and I have worked together for the last 12 years. This is his 12th year here at the college. Phil has a very special job. Uh, it used to be called the SID, the Sports Information Director. What's the title now? We're shifting into Athletics Communications. Athletics Communications. And one of the parts, I can't speak to his job, but I know I can speak to this part about my job that relates to Phil's, is the communication aspect of what is being sent out there about us in terms of social media. It's definitely changing rapidly, very, very rapidly. And Phil has worked a lot with our department on trying to bring us into the fold and some of the different changes out there. There is a, there's a different language going on. As you saw my son, Brooke, well, his, his younger brother's 10 years old. They speak a totally different language in just that six-year gap. And the four-year-old that Ben played with the other day spoke a total different language than the 10-year-old. It's, it's, it's crazy. So Phil's here to give a us a little bit of insight into how to operate in that world of language of differences. Phil Tickner. social media, uh, my first thought was to do the entire presentation in 140 characters or less. Uh, I realized that that probably wouldn't fill 18 minutes, so we have a few other things to discuss. Um, I, as Mike said, it's rapidly changing. Um, in our field, we have an annual convention. In 2009, at that convention, there was one panel about what at the time was called social networking websites, um, which now we call social media, which I think is a much more um, accurate description. In 2012, three years later, our convention, over 50% of the programming either directly or indirectly related to social media. So in three years' time, we went from you know, sort of an afterthought, and we're the communications professionals, right? And in 2009, we were barely you know, hanging on to things. Three years later, that's all we talk about. Um, I'm going to say, I'm mainly going to talk today about uh, Facebook and Twitter. Those are obviously the kings of the social media world. There's plenty of other social media type stuff out there that you may or may not be familiar with. Instagram for photos. Pinterest for lists, which is remarkable because it's really probably the first thing ever born on the internet that was dominated by women as early adopters. Um, YouTube now is basically considered social media, even though it predates all these other websites. And frankly, I don't think it gets much more social media than someone making a video about something and then someone else responding to them in video format. Um, LinkedIn, uh, and I'll touch on that briefly uh, towards the end of this talk. And for the five or six people out there still stuck in 2005 MySpace. <laughs> you may be wondering uh, why you need to care about this, and I, there's a lot of reasons, but I'll, I'll give you three really simple ones. Number one, you work with teenagers. Uh, number two, you work in a visible profession subject to public criticism and praise. And number three, teenagers use social media a lot, and they don't have much of a problem sharing public criticism or praise. <laughs> Um, to give you some idea, I, I guess really, I mean, everybody knows, oh gosh, everybody's on Facebook, everybody's on Twitter. But sometimes seeing the numbers doesn't help. 91% of online adults use social media regularly. I also found out today, I, I don't know where I saw it, but for the first time the world's online population has surpassed the world's population from 1950. There are more people online in the world right now than there were people in the world just 60, 65, not even 63 years ago. 93% of adult internet users are on Facebook, um, so there's 7% of everyone out there who's still sort of lagging behind. And this number was, was smaller than I thought. 73% of teens are on a social network. The other 27% have mean parents. <laughs> I added that. Um, it's possible that some of those 27% had their parents watching them when they answered the survey. Um, their parents may not know they're on a social network. And, act and actually, that, that statistic is for teens ages 12 to 17. Um, my guess is that if we're talking most of the age range in this room, um, 14, to, 14 to 18, that number's a lot higher. Um, usage, I love this. Every minute of the day, there's 100,000 tweets sent every minute. Um, 684, and that's just an absurd number. Pieces of content <laughs> shared on Facebook, and 3,600 photos shared on Instagram. And as a group, all of us Facebookers, users spend a total of 20,000 years per day on Facebook. 20,000 years. I, I did the math for what that meant in a year, and it came out like 11 billion. I'm not happy with it. Social is where we live. I love the first one, and I get, again, I think people are underreporting. 24% of people have missed witnessing important moments because they were busy writing about them on social networks. 
By the way, I don't mind. I don't know if I consider this an important li um, life moment, so if you want to tweet during this, it's perfectly acceptable. Just tweet about this. Um, and 40% of people spend more time socializing online than they do face-to-face. -face. That number probably rising every day, and for your student athletes, that number, I'm, I don't know, I'm going to guess is at least 50% higher. Facebook versus Twitter. Facebook's estimated number of registered users surpasses 2 billion. That's greater than the population of China. I think, is China hit 2 billion yet? Probably not. It's active users, I don't know how that's defined, but it's a statistic I got, uh, number 950 million. Twitter has over 500 million registered users, over 140 million active users. Again, active, I'm guessing, is somewhat defined by how often people post or tweet. Um, in that other 360 million in Twitter, I'm guessing a lot of those folks are people who are active in the sense that they listen, but they don't tweet. There's a lot of folks on Twitter who are only on Twitter to follow things. They don't really tweet a lot themselves. Social's mobile, um, and that's pretty important because of the immediacy of how fast people can, people can post. And all of your teen, teen athletes who are walking around like this, they might not be texting their friend. They might be posting on Facebook or Twitter. One third of Facebook users access Facebook mobile on their smartphones or tablets. I guess the other two thirds don't have smartphones or tablets, I'm not really sure. Uh, and it says tables, I meant tablets. So. Uh, over 50% of Twitter users access Twitter on their mobile devices. Uh, Twitter is probably, one reason Twitter continues to grow, probably the most friendly, um, mobile friendly uh, social platform there is, partially because you're limited to 140 characters. Teens on Facebook, the average teen has 201 Facebook friends. If you notice, only 50% of all Facebook users have over 100 friends. This is an interesting one because of this. Do you think the average teen has 201 people in their lives that they can actually trust? <laughs> No. So even when they're thinking that they're only, oh, it's okay, I'm only posting it so my friends can see. 55% <laughs> of teens have given out personal information to strangers on Facebook. 29% have posted mean information, embarrassing photos, or spread rumors on Facebook. Again, I think the second number's low. They're self-reporting. It depends on what you consider mean or rumors. From 2010 to 2012, the percentage of teens on Twitter doubled. This is my own hypothesis. I've seen it backed up by a few folks who think the same way. Teens are going to Twitter to get away from their parents who are all on Facebook. Most don't realize that Twitter, by default, is less private than Facebook. Um, so sure, they could be on Facebook, and I think a lot of them still have their Facebook accounts, and that's where grandma can see the, the new pictures from Christmas and whatever, and when they're upset with something, they go on Twitter and they tweet it for the entire world to see, which seems a little bit backward logic, but it's the world we're living in. Why it's called social media, and boy, am I going fast. Um, Why well, it's called social media. Coach fired over a rant. This happened in November. Uh, Huntington College, Division III school in Alabama. Um, the golf coach was fired after he went on a profanity-laced tirade. As an aside, it's a little bit amusing if you do go credit it. Um, against his team on the bus home from tournament. It was an easy case to fire him because one of the one of the players on the bus, he had done it before, so this kid was prepared, <laughs> shot a video and posted it on social media. Um, so that's pretty open and shut. That's not a he said, she said case. <laughs> there was video evidence. And speaking of fire, we had something happen here this year. Our women's soccer team was on their way to their, their first game of the season. The back of the bus caught fire. And the first people to know about it would have been people following our student athletes on Twitter. Because before anyone else was even there, they were tweeting it. And in fact, created a hashtag that stuffed the rest of the season, which was girls on fire. Um, <laughs> So I guess a lot of people got the Hunger Games reference there. Um, we got a lot of mileage out of that, actually. So that's the flip side of social media. We, we continued to use it all season. Um, we'll get to the, I guess, you know, what does some of this stuff mean? And how can you educate your student athletes? Like, probably some of these last will stop, unfortunately. But um, most Facebook users, teens included, do limit their visible Facebook content to friends only. But of course, with over 200 friends, I don't really sure how that, I'm not really sure how that's private. Um, what you can equate that to is essentially, and it's kind of what I'm doing, I mean, how many people are in this room? A hundred? A hundred people. So, if, you know, if I felt like I'm being, if, if I feel like I'm in a private space, I should be able to tell you anything. And I, I'm not going to. Um, and so that's really no different than if they went out to a party and, well, there's 200 people I kind of know, which is essentially the definition of most people's friends on Facebook. It's a bunch of people that you kind of know. There's some people that you really know and a bunch of people you kind of know. And if they stood up on a chair, and they just shouted something. Is that private? No, because certainly everybody who's heard it can go and tell anyone else. On Twitter, um, by default on Twitter, uh, everything is public. Uh, you can go in and protect your tweets. Most people don't do it. And frankly, 
if you do do that, you're kind of missing the boat on a lot of what's great about Twitter. Um, unprotected tweets are easily searched and accessed, even without a Twitter account. Um, my Twitter account is at ptickner. If you go to twitter.com slash ptickner, you will see all my tweets, regardless of whether or not you even have a Twitter account. It's that easy. I, I really don't know if teens have just completely missed the boat on this. Um, or, or what's going on, but let me see if we get to the, yeah, unprotected tweets and public Facebook content are more public than publishing a newspaper article about yourself, and then making sure that the people who are most interested in what's going on with you are the people who get the first copies. Um, and so the lesson there is, I think that's the next one. Oh, okay, here's, we've got that comment later. Um, let them know you're there. You don't have to stalk them. I don't, you know, I, certainly when you're working with minors, I wouldn't encourage you to go stalk them or make them be your friends or anything, but, have a presence, you know, talk about it. If you are on Twitter or on Facebook, you're oh, no, on Twitter, oh, they're gonna go, oh, Coach thinks they're trying to be cool. That's all right, they'll be in the back of their head that you're out there. Um, demonstrate that you get it, that you understand, that, you know, it's, it's not, if you send something on Twitter, you, you haven't sent a Twitter, you sent a tweet, things like that. Um, <laughs> or maybe you wanna play dumb if you're trying to run like a little sting operation, that's fine too. <laughs> Um, if they, and I do, some people might disagree with this, I 100% think this is the right idea. If they leave their accounts public, let them know, let them know, give them fair warning, that you might check in from time to time and then do it. Why? One private conversation about something they posted which was inappropriate, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be something horrible, if it is, obviously a bigger issues, but just something, or potentially hurtful to someone, take them aside and say, you might want to rethink your privacy settings because I saw it. And if I saw it, your parents might see it, your teachers might see it, the person that you're talking about might see it. And at least, and then of course there's, there's the, the little text chat, right, OMG. Can't believe Coach saw that. Um, it, it shouldn't really be that hard for them to believe. Ah, that's what I was getting at. Don't be your own bad press. I, and I tell our student athletes this every year. If you'd be embarrassed if a newspaper or television station ran a story about it, you probably shouldn't post it or tweet it. And that actually goes for everyone. Um, from a professional development standpoint and from sort of a CYA and we knew about the hunting culture. I hated to post that, but certainly had he tweeted at my team's face, the same result would have happened. Um, this goes for everyone, not just teams or athletes. And after all that, you, shouldn't still, you should still not be terrified. Social media, use it to engage. Um, and it, this is all based on time, um, obviously. Um, but if you can, if you have the ability to create a Facebook page or a group, um, or a Twitter account for your team. You can update keep your parents and, and fans and things like that informed of great races, important regattas coming up. And then this third one, um, highly recommend using, if, you are, if you're on Twitter now, I'll call you guys like the, the, um, the moderate users, not quite at the, like the advanced user stage, but you're, you know, you, you've got a handle on it, you're on Twitter, you're active on there. Use something like Hootsuite, it's free, there is a pro version, um, but it's free, there's a website you can use for it and an app for your phone. Um, what I'm trying to think of the other, TweetDeck is one of the other major ones, um, to follow Twitter chatter and give feedback. And what that means, I think I have some of it in the handout I gave. Um, the great thing about Twitter and the public, contact on, the public content on Twitter is that it is highly searchable. Those platforms allow you to save searches. You can do the same thing in the regular Twitter, Twitter interface, but Hootsuite is very good at like, you can just scroll through, you have different panels. Um, so say for example, um, you know, you've, you're the rowing coach at Valley High School. You might want to type, you know, in quotes, Valley High School, say that as a search. Maybe Valley High School rowing, it depends on how specific you want to get. Um, if you think there might be someone out there talking about you specifically, put your own name in the search. Um, and keep your eyes open. Um, one, that is, again, as a cover your own butt uh, standpoint, but also just for things like, the, the first time it really hit me about how effective Twitter was, um, was a couple years ago, such a, a lousy story. Um, a couple years ago, my wife and I, for our anniversary, our wedding anniversary, um, were like, we're gonna go spend the day at the beach. We went down. Um, it just so happens, 10 minutes after my wife got in the water, rogue wave, knocked her down. She was just out there waiting. Took off her brand new, like $200 high prescription glasses, and they, the Atlantic Ocean now has them. Um, we had to stop on the way back to get her new glasses, and I'm like, oh, what a horrible day. So I tweet, and I'm like, well, Wife and I going out to Melting Pot, trying to salvage a bad anniversary. Melting Pot, within five minutes, responded to my tweet. I didn't do at Melting Pot, I just said the phrase Melting Pot. Responded to my tweet, wish us a happy anniversary and hope we had a great time. 
That's the kind of stuff that Twitter allows you to do if you use those safe searches. So if you see someone talking about, hey, I saw Valley High School rowing team today, they did great, and you have that saved, and you see that, you can respond to that person and say, thanks a lot for the support, you know, hope we'll see you at one of our races. And that really, I think, goes a long way if you actually engage folks in social media rather than just listen. Uh, use it to grow. Uh, it's obviously a great resource for exchanging ideas. There's some chatter going on today from this event, um, probably some other talks and conventions you go to, but then just every day. Um, if anyone knows John Leakley, I'm going to out him in the back, uh, men's rowing coach here. He's a, a great resource for him if you want to follow him, a great resource for you guys if you want to follow him on Twitter. Um, John tweets all sorts of stuff, not just about rowing, but about higher ed and social media and things like that. Um, LinkedIn is a professional website. Um, I sort of have mixed thoughts on how effective it can be, but it's definitely good on there. It's good to be on there and have your resume if you are someone who's looking to move up in the coaching world or just in your own um, full-time professions. Um, establishing an active but professional social media presence can act as an extended resume. I also say this to our student athletes, and you can, for the younger folks in the room, remember it for yourselves, and also tell your own student athletes that one of the first places employers go is the internet. Google, Facebook, Twitter to find information about someone. Any employer worth their salt is checking those because why bother paying for a background check if you can do it yourself? College admissions, sure, anything. And if you want to send me an email or hit me up on Twitter, <laughs> um, feel free. I'm not the most active to, uh, uh, person on Twitter, I will admit that. I'm, I'm a personal account. I'm very active on our um, at WC Athletics account. Um, but I sort of peaks and valleys. But if someone tweets at me, I'll get back to them immediately. Um, I got 227 now. I did pretty good. <laughs> um, that's the gist of it. Uh, I know we were probably two and a half minutes behind, so I think I fixed the problem. Um, I'm fine going to questions if that I. Oh no, I've screwed everything up. The timer. We can. Um, you, you had mentioned about like admissions looking mm -hmm. up. So let's say we have an athlete that is looking to be, you know, go to a college for rowing. And so if a rowing coach from a college, say Washington College, is gonna look up that athlete and you see something on Facebook that's inappropriate, like a picture of them like half naked or drunk or whatever, <laughs> um, is that going to affect you recruiting them? You know, that's a good question. I think it's an image that we have in our mind and I think as Linda was saying with culture, I think it prompts a conversation. You know, and I, I don't, I, I take all that, as we do a lot of recruiting, I take that as just a little data point. As, you know, you talk to, we call up, we call you up, we talk to coaches, we talk to the guidance counselors, that's just a little thing, but that would prompt a conversation. We have had, I remember a couple of years ago, we had an assistant coach from here, not a rowing coach, went to apply for a full-time job. She walked in the office, guy turned around the screen and said, you have 24 hours to get that picture off of Facebook or you are out of the uh, consideration for this job. And that was, that was the interview. And, and good luck trying to get anything off within 24 hours. What kids don't realize, if I may, is that there are several sites out there, businesses, that are archiving the web every day. So whatever's put up on the internet is there on the internet. It may not, it may be bumped off the top page of Google search, but it's out there. So that's one thing. I think we we're kind of obliged to tell our kids that. So when we see something like that, I mean, it prompts a conversation. I'm sorry, Phil. I didn't mean to take your time. Other questions? Social media and your kids? Well, here's one, I, if I may, can I throw in? One thing about email, it's, which is a little different, is that what we, how we operate at the college level is that anything that we write about a student in email is that student's property. So if I were to send an email to Coach Leakley and say, boy, John's a, uh, John Smith is a real bozo, da, 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 then that's that student's property. They have the right to see that, and they do see that. And so that's something that we need to, uh, as professionals here at the college level, we need to keep in mind. Now, I'm not saying that applies everywhere, but there are plenty of things popping up nowadays that things put on on social media have affected people's employment, have affected their uh, colleges they get into, different things like that. Anybody else who questions social media? Phil, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Well done. Well done.